Welcome back once again to 60 Minutes to Lose, the show where we see how far we can get into a game in 60 minutes. Today's episode is a mistake. <laughs> Today we have Taboo, The Sixth Sense, developed by Rare, published by Trade West. This is not a game. It's literally not. It is classified as a non-game on Wikipedia. There is no real gameplay to be seen. This is a tarot card reading simulator. Uh, known for containing a lot of content that normally Nintendo would not be cool with, such as religious imagery, nudity, things like that. So yeah, if you're ready to see some 8-bit uh, titties, I've already had my share. For some reason, when I looked up the box art for this game, I just searched a Taboo NES. All I got was a shit ton of porn. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's where we start here. All that has been and all that will be is here for you to know. Dare you glimpse the future? Dare you even ask? Oh, I guess so. Okay, okay. So we, ha we have to put in our name. We're just going to get my own fortune here. My name, my real name is Paul, so we will go ahead and use Paul. That is it, that's my name, birthday. I'm gonna dox myself here for all you to see. My birthday is actually coming right up in just in two days here. 9, 18. Now, this is gonna confuse the game because my birthday is after the game already came out. It's probably gonna be like, that's, that's impossible, man. I am a male. Okay, your question. Oh, I can actually ask questions. This could take me a while. Um. Will I become wealthy? Everybody asks, you know. We we have to go there. Okay. Now here we go. It's it's determining the truth. It's going to uh, hit us with some arcane knowledge. The Knight of Cups. I will not deal the cards. Okay. 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 I don't know what any of this means, but I'm here for the ride, you know? Okay. Give me one second. I actually forgot to close my door to downstairs, so, uh, I'm just gonna... I'm actually gonna leave the video feed running? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, f I forget to do that every time. Okay, here we go. Significator. Card. The Ace of Staffs. Your present position is inheritance or other gain. Okay. I believe you. But what does it mean? Crossing card. The Ten of Swords. Your immediate influence is disappointment. Well, okay, that's... That's probably not so good. Probably means that uh, I will not come into a particular amount of wealth anytime soon. The Hermit. The best that you can currently be accomplished, that, that can currently be accomplished, is search for solitude, knowledge, or self denial. I'm sure that means something. But it doesn't seem particularly positive. The Wheel. The Wheel of for Fortune. Present events are based on to meet your fate or destiny. Based on to meet. It's it's kind of a lot of nothing, isn't it? Like, uh, it's not really telling me much. Okay, the moon. Recent past events are to be taken advantage of false friends or being misled. doesn't seem accurate. Not to me. This is not good son. Oh, there you go! It's the nudity, the high priestess. The near forthcoming influence is experience, lack of patience with others. This seems to like all be incorrect text. <laughs> None of this makes sense. Where one finds oneself. Strength. You, in a proper perspective, have to overcome a difficult situation at considerable peril. 
you know, I seldom find myself in moments of peril, so I'm gonna assume that that was a, um, a miscommunication there. The Queen of Swords, viewed by others, you are loneliness, separation, or abandonment. I am loneliness! I am the definition of loneliness! Uh, Taboo told me, you can't deny it. Your secret fears or wants are malicious, but weak person. So, okay, what I'm, what I'm figuring from all this here is, it's kind of procedurally generating sentences, and they're turning out to be nonsense most of the time. <laughs> what do we got here? The Seven of Staffs, the culmination of the events revealed before, will be possible victories. Oh, great. Select your state. Oh, nah, now I'm now I'm really doxing myself. Hold on, how, how do I select my state here? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to do any of this here. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. No, I, I'm from Minnesota. This is... Where's Minnesota? It's supposed to be MN, man. I feel ripped off. It's Minnesota. I am not legally allowed to play this game. They have New Brunswick and British Columbia, but they don't have Minnesota. They have Michigan, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine. Dude, how could they forget? <laughs> I'm not from any of these. I guess I'll have to pick Iowa, because that's the closest. I don't know what minimum or maximum means here. Let's just, uh, sure. Let's just go all the way, right? What does amount of numbers mean? I, I don't know, man. None of this means anything to me. Okay, these are my lucky numbers, I guess. Thanks for not giving me Minnesota, man. Alright, well, we've done it. We have indeed done it. We have, uh, achieved our reading there is nothing else to do that's the game so it gives you a bunch of procedurally generated uh, sentences that generally don't make any kind of grammatical sense making them pretty much impossible to parse out and read and get any actual information from I asked it will I be wealthy and it basically said hey here's a bunch of stuff so um, how do we fill an hour with this game uh, well, what I'm going to do for you is um, I'm going to uh, read a little bit about tarot for you here. Uh, we're going to turn this into the Wikipedia show here. Uh, from this on, fr from this point on here, I'd like to understand what are we looking at here. I know it's a tarot card reading piece of software. I know that that's kind of the, uh, the concept, but uh, what does that mean? Uh, obviously, tarot. Our cards, uh, it says here that they have been used from at least the mid-15th century in various parts of Europe to play games uh, such as Italian uh, Terracini, French Tarot, and Australian uh, Konegrufen, many of which are still played today. In the late 18th century, some tarot decks began to be used for divination via tarot card reading and cardomancy, leading to custom decks developed for such occult purposes. So, when tarot was initially created, uh, it, it, this was not the intention. It was literally just used to play games. They were like, hey man, solitaire's getting boring. <laughs> Although solitaire probably existed way after tarot. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, I actually didn't know that. that that's interesting. So we did learn something here. Uh, like the common playing cards, tarot has four suits, which vary by region. French suits in Northern Europe, Latin suits in Southern Europe, and German suits in Central Europe. Each suit has 14 cards, 10 pip cards, numbering from 1 or ace to 10, and four face cards, king, queen, knight, and jack. In addition, the tarot has a separate 21 card trump suit and a single card known as the fool. This 22 card selection of the tarot deck is known in divinatory circles as the major arcana. Depending on the game, the fool may act as the top trump or may be played to avoid following suit. These tarot cards are still used throughout much of Europe to play conventional card games without occult associations. Right, as we have learned, the, the, 
those are games that you can still play to this day. I, I suppose as long as it is documented, you can still play it. Among English-speaking countries where these games are not played frequently, tarot cards are used primarily for novelty or divinatory purposes. Yes, we've been over that. Usually using spe specially designed packs. Some who use tarot for cardomancy believe that the cards have esoteric links to ancient Egypt, the Kabbalah, Indian Tantra, or the I Ching. So basically everything. Uh, those scholarly research has demonstrated demonstrated that tarot cards were invented in northern Italy in the 15th century and confirmed that there is no historical evidence of the usage of tarot for divination before the late 18th century. A little bit of redundant information there. Uh, we did go over a little bit earlier the fact that uh, that 18th century was around when uh, the occult purposes started to take off for it here. Uh, the the playing cards first entered Europe in the late 14th century, most likely from Mamluk, Egypt. Okay, the first records date to 1367. You know, you can say 14th century, and I know it's a long time ago, but when you say 1367, then I definitely feel like it was a while ago <laughs> in Bern. And they appear to have spread very rapidly across the whole of Europe, as may be seen from the records, mainly of card games being banned. <laughs> yeah, people people didn't like cards back then, you know? It's always like, oh, you play cards, you're going to wind up murdering somebody with a b bazooka. Little is known about the appearance and number of these cards, the only significant information being provided by a text by John of... Rain Felden in 1377 from Freiburg im Briesgau. Probably didn't have to roll my R's there, but I felt like it anyway. Who, in addition to other versions, describes the basic pack as containing the still current four suits of 13 cards, the courts, uh, usually being the king, Ober, and Unter, although dames and queens were already known by then as well. One early pattern of playing cards that evolved was one with the suit of batons, or clubs, coins, swords, and cups. These suits are still used in the traditional uh, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese playing card decks, but have also been adapted in packs used specifically for tarot divination cards that first appeared in the late 18th century, and that I know as well. I do know that uh, the cups, the swords, all that. I see that all over, referenced on various media, lots of video games occasionally, and you know, TV shows and whatnot. Tarot does indeed keep a large footprint. The first documented tarot packs were recorded between 1440 and 1450 in Milan, Ferrara, Florence, and uh, Bologna. Is it pronounced Bologna? It can't be baloney, right? <laughs> when additional trump cards with allegorical illustrations were added to the common four suit pack, these new decks were called Carte de Triomphe, Triumph cards, and the additional cards, simply known as Triomphe, which became Trumps in English. There you go. So when people talk about having a trump card, that's exactly what they are referring to. It would be uh, those extra cards in the tarot deck, you're, I assume that that refers to your high priestess, your hanged man, things such as that. The earliest documentation of Triomphi is found in a written statement in the court records of Florence in 1440 regarding the transfer of two decks to Sigismondo Pandolfo Malatesta. Okay. Here you go. The oldest surviving tarot cards are the 15 or so Visconti Sforza tarot card uh, tarot decks painted in the mid 15th century for the rulers of the duchy of milan a lost tarot like pack was commissioned by duke uh filippo maria visconti and described by martiano da tortona probably between 1418 and 1425 since the partner he mentions michelano di bisoso returned to milan in 1418 blah 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 blah, blah. just a little bit of history there uh uh, yeah, the Visconti Sforza tarot deck. They can be found in various museums, uh, libraries, and of course, private collections. Rich people gotta get themselves uh, the newest Visconti Sforza. You know, everyone else is gonna scoff at your lack of wealth if you don't got the old VS sitting on the shelf. No complete deck has survived. Rather, some collections boast a few face cards, while some consist of merely a single card. They are the oldest surviving tarot cards and date back to a period, but were still called uh, the Triumphs. Yep. And used for everyday playing. Okay, cool, cool. I, uh, there's a little bit of uh, 
pictures of them there. Oh, they look very nice. They look very nice. Very uh, beautiful artwork here. Wish you could see it, but you know I don't have uh, my full screen share because that's just asking for trouble. Anyway, that's that's just an aside. In Florence, an expanded deck called Minciati was used. The deck of 97 cards includes astrological symbols and the four elements, as well as traditional tarot motifs. You're like, oh, a 97 card deck of tarot? That's insane. Because the earliest tarot cards were hand painted, the number of the decks produced is thought to have been small. It was only after the invention of the printing press that mass production of cards became possible. The expansion of tarot outside of Italy, first to France and Switzerland, occurred during the Italian Wars. The most important tarot pattern in these two countries was the Tarot of Marseille, of Milanese origin. And boy, I bet you're wondering at this point, well, hey, what the heck does, uh, does tarot mean? Well, wouldn't you know it? Our good friends at Wikipedia have us covered with the full etymology of the word here, which I'm going to tell you as well because, uh, quite frankly, I just need to waste an hour of time. Yes, people asked me, well, one person asked me, how are you going to fill an hour of taboo? This is how, by not playing the game. <laughs> but, you know, again, it, it is clearly defined as a non-game, so I don't feel bad um, messing around with this one here. You can just observe the beautiful title screen there. Uh, the word tarot in German tarot derives from the Italian tarocci, the origin of which is uncertain. Oh, thanks. But uh, tarot was used as a synonym for foolishness in the late 15th and 16th centuries. The decks were known exclusively as triumphi during the 15th century, which they went over. Triumph decks. The new name first appeared in Brescia around 1502 as tarocho. During the 16th century, a new game played with a standard deck but sharing a very similar name, Triomphe, as opposed to Triomphe, was quickly becoming popular. This coincided with the older game being renamed Tarocci. In modern Italian, the singular term is Tarocco, which as a noun refers to a cultivar of blood orange. Interesting. I wonder why. The attribute Tarocco and the verb uh, Tarocair are used regionally to indicate that something is fake or forged. This meaning is directly derived from the Taracci game as played in Italy, in which Tarocco indicates a card can be played in place of another card. Okay, I think I get it. So it was a mechanic within the game that, uh, hey, instead of playing this card, I'm going to play this card instead, but that that kind of acts as a fake version of that card in a way. So, uh, you know, I like that fact about it meaning foolishness, though. That is that is goofy. I'm going to skip the whole uh, gaming deck section because Taboo didn't cover that. It strictly covered um, the reading here. Uh, so going straight to card reading, there's actually an entire article just on tarot card reading itself. And, oh, my goodness, there is some juicy information here. Now, this... This is a little more up my alley here in terms of information. I enjoy reading about the paranormal. I enjoy reading about the occult. I, I find it all very interesting. And I do believe in a fair bit of it because it's more fun that way. Uh, yes, so let's see. Going in more into the history of reading here. One of the earliest reference to tarot triumphs, and probably the first reference to tarot as the Devil's Picture Book, <laughs> is given approximately 1460 by a Dominican preacher in a fiery sermon against the evils of the Devil's Instrument. References to the tarot as a social plague continued throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, but there are no indications that the cards were used for anything but games anywhere other than in Bologna. As, philo as philosopher, yeah, philosopher and tarot historian Michael Dumay noted, it was only in the 1780s when the practice of fortune telling with regular playing cards had been well established for at least two decades that anyone began to use the tarot pack for cardomancy. So even before tarot, we were already saying, yeah, man, I got a, I got a seven of diamonds here. It probably means you're screwed. Uh, you're going to die next week. Your cattle are going to die. Uh, you, your wife will live, but uh, the cattle will be dead and you'll be dead, so she'll basically be dead too. Uh, and that's that's how they... That's how they told your fortune then. 
The belief in the divinatory meaning of the cards is closely associated with a belief in their occult properties, a commonly held belief in the 18th century propagated by prominent Protestant clerics and Freemasons. One of them was Court de Gébelin. I'm just going to assume that's how it's pronounced because it's more posh. From its uptake as an instrument of prophecy in France, the tarot went on to be used in uh, hermeneutic, magical, mystical, semiotic, and psychological practices. It was used by Romani people in telling fortunes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Romani people, otherwise known uh, fairly derogatorily as gypsies. Uh, as a Jungian philosophical apparatus capable of tapping into absolute knowledge in the unconscious, a tool for archetypical analysis, and even a tool for facilitating the Jungian process of, in, of individuation. Now, if I really wanted to go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, I could tell you what all of that stuff means, too. But for right now, I'm going to keep it... Uh, <laughs> Keep it on track here. You, you don't tune into this channel to hear Wikipedia every day, but uh, you know what? May, maybe you consider this a treat. Maybe this is a pleasant deviation from the norm. You're not just watching Predator for 60 minutes this time. Uh, okay, so they're getting more into court the Jebelin at this point here uh, it says many involved in occult and divinatory practices attempt to trace the tarot to ancient Egypt which we did we, we learned in the parent article uh, divine hermetic wisdom and the mysteries of Isis possibly the first of those was Antoine Court de Jebelin a French clergyman who wrote that after seeing a group of women playing cards he had the idea that tarot was not merely a game of cards but was in fact of ancient Egyptian origin of mystical Kabbalistic import and of deep divine significance how he came to this conclusion I'm uncertain he just looked at it and he said absolutely that is something more than just pieces of paper with some cool paintings on them Court de Jebelin published a dissertation on the origins of the symbolism in the tarot in volume 8 of work Le Monde Primitif in 1781. He thought the tarot represented ancient Egyptian theology, including Isis, Osiris, and Typhon. For example, he thought the card he knew as Papes, and today known as the High Priestess, represented Isis. He also related four tarot cards to the four Christian cardinal virtues, temperance, justice, strength, and prudence. Yep. He relates the tower to a Greek fable about avarice. Although the ancient Egyptian language had not yet been deciphered, Court de Jebelin asserted the name tarot from the Egyptian words tar, meaning path or road, and the word ro, ross or rog, meaning king or royal, and that the tarot literally translated to the royal road of life. Later Egyptologists found nothing in the Egyptian language to support uh, uh, Court de Jebelin's etymologies. Ah, what a shame. He thought he was so close to finding something brilliant there, only to find out, uh, don't, sorry, uh, you were off by a mile, man. Despite this lack of evidence, the belief that the tarot cards are linked to the Egyptian Book of Toth continues to the present day. That's neat. The actual source of the occult tarot can be traced to two articles in volume 8, one written by himself and one written by M. Lesse de M. That's what it says. It says M. Lesse de M. I don't know. Hold on. What is, what is this footnote here? The asterisks and the abbreviations are the actual way Corte de Jebelin refers to the second essay. Okay, yeah, he, he M. Dot le c dot de m dot asterisk 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 dot who is this mystery man this is the most shocking and confusing thing i've ever read on a wikipedia article in my life anyway the second has been noted to have been even more influential than court de jebelins the author takes court de jebelins speculations even further agreeing with him about the mystical origins of the tarot in ancient egypt but making several additional and influential statements that continue to influence mass understanding of the occult tarot even to this day he made the first statements proposing that the tarot was the book of toth and made the first association of tarot with cardamancy Court de Jebelin was also the first to imply the existence of a connection between the tarot and the Romani people, although this connection did not become well established in the public consciousness until other French authors, such as Bertrand d'Amblay and Jean-Alexandre Valiant, 
begin in the 1850s to promote the theory that tarot cards had been brought to Europe by the Romani, which, you know, was just kind of a bunch of racist bullshit. Where they're like, hey, we don't we don't like the Romani. What can we pin on them? Uh, sure. Uh, tarot, it's your fault. <laughs> The first who assigned divinatory meanings to the cards was Cardinal Anthony Jean Baptiste Ariet, who they mentioned. And no, they did not mention him. This is the first that this person is uh, referred to, also known as Atelia, or Atela, sorry, in 1783. According to Deme, or Dummet, I don't know how it's pronounced, probably Deme, because it's fancier. Atela devised a method of tarot divination in 1783 wrote a cardamantic treatise of tarot as the Book of Toth, created the first society for tarot cardomancy, the Société Littéraire des Associés Libres de Interprétés de Livre de Toth, uh, it's all French. I can't. I don't speak French. Created the first corrected tarot, supposedly fixing errors that resulted from misinterpretation and corruption through the mists of antiquity. I like. I love how they word that. Corruption through the mists of antiquity. If that ain't a black metal album title, I don't know what is. This whole thing was known as the Grand Atela deck. Created the first Egyptian tarot to be used exclusively for tarot cardomancy and published under the imprint of his society, the Dictionnaire Synonymique de Livre de Toth, a book that systematically tabulated all the possible meanings which each card could bear when upright and reversed. Okay, so, yeah, you know, when people lay out the tarot cards and they pull it out and they're like, Oh no! The Wheel of Fortune is upside down! You're going to lose the lottery again! Ah! Etela also suggested that tarot was repository to the wisdom of Hermes Trismegistus. I mean, we all knew that. I definitely know who that guy is, uh, was a book of eternal medicine, was an account of the creation of the world, and argued that the first copy of the tarot was imprinted on leaves of gold. Dude, the lore! The lore just keeps giving. In the in his 18, not, sorry, in his 1980 book, The Game of Tarot, Michael Dumay suggested that Etela was attempting to supplant Court de Jeblin as the author of the occult tarot. Etela, in fact, claimed to have been involved with tarot longer than Court de Jeblin. Oh, okay, a little bit of a, a little bit of a dispute there. I invented occult tarot. No, I invented occult tarot. But behold, a new challenger has appeared. Enter Marie Anne Lenormand. Uh, me, Marie Anne Adelaide Lenormand. Get, get a shorter name. Outshone even Atela, and was the first cardomancer to people in high places, though her claims to be the personal confidant of Empress Josephine, Napoleon, and other notables. No, through her claims. Yes, through her claims to be the personal confidant of Empress Josephine, Napoleon, and other notables. So this lady, she's like the go-to fortune teller for Empress Josephine and for Napoleon, or so she claims. Pretty nuts. Lenormand used both regular playing cards, in particular the PK pack, as well as tarot cards likely derived from the Tarot de Marseille. Following her death in 1843, several different cardomantic decks were published in her name, including the uh, Grand Jeu de Mille Lenormand, based on the standard 52 card deck, first published in 1845. Years, years, words, words. That's not the interesting stuff here. Uh, and it just, it just kind of goes on and on, you know? I'm going to skip ahead a bit here um, to more modern history here, uh, just because a lot of this is a little bit samey, uh, but I'm going to come to a name that probably the majority of people here know. Let me just make sure that I'm in the right section here. Sorry, I, I didn't rehearse any of this beforehand, so I'm, I'm kind of flying off the seat of my pants here. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Ah, uh, yeah. That's going to do numbers. In the late 1880s, no, the late 1880s, not only saw the spread of the occult tarot in France, but also its initial adoption in the English-speaking world. 
1886, Arthur Edward Waite published The Mysteries of Magic, a selection of Levi's writings translated by Waite and the first significant treatment of the occult to be published in England. However, it was only through the establishment of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, those magnificent bastards, in 1888 that the occult tarot was to become established as a tool in the English-speaking world. Of the three founding members of the Golden Dawn, two being Samuel Little Mathers and William Wynne Westcott, WWW, well, look at that guy, published texts relating to the occult tarot prior to the founding of the order. Westcott is known to have made ink sketches of tarot trumps in or around 1886 and discussed the tarot in his treatise Tabula Bambina, Sive Mensa Isaka published in 1887. I thought this was supposed to be the English section. <laughs> While Mathers had published the first British work primarily focusing on the tarot in his 1888 booklet entitled The Tarot, Its Occult Signification. Now that I can pronounce. Use in fortune telling and method of play. Oh, sorry. That's that's the full name. The Tarot, Its Occult Signification, Use in fortune telling and method of play. I wouldn't call it the catchiest of all names, but it certainly gets its point across. The tarot was also mentioned explicitly in the cipher manuscripts that served as the founding document of the Hermetic Order, both implicitly and in the form of a separate essay accompanying the manuscript. This essay was to serve as the basis for most tarot interpretations by the Golden Dawn and its immediate successors, including such features as placing the fool before the other 21 trumps when determining a Kabbalistic correspondence of the major arcana to the Hebrew alphabet, attributing the Hebrew alphabet correspondences to, uh, to pathways in the Tree of Life, swapping the positions of the 8th and 11th arcana, being justice and strength, and reassigning Kabbalistic planetary associations to accord with the reordered trumps. What does all that mean? That's up to you to find out. <laughs> I'm just reading, man. The Golden Dawn also renamed the suits of batons and coins to wands and pentacles. I have seen that. I've seen both renditions used. Swapped the order of the king and the knight among the court cards. Renamed them the prince and the king, respectively. Changed the page to become the princess. How forward thinking. Assigned each of the court cards, too, to the letters of the Tetragrammaton, thus associating both the court cards and the suits to the four classical elements, and associated each of the 36 cards ranked from 2 to 10 to, uh, from 2 to 10, inclusive with one of the 36 astrological decans. So basically, they confused it all up. They said, you know what the biggest problem with tarot is? It's just been too simple. <laughs> let's uh let's bring this up a notch here uh, <laughs> the hermetic order never released its own tarot deck for public use preferring instead for members to create their own copies of a deck designed by mathers with art by his wife moina mathers <laughs> hey guys you can have your tarot but uh you got to use my wife's art She's been working real hard on this. She's uh, she's a really good drawer. Trust me, you're going to want hers on your tarot. Uh, however, many of these innovations would make their first public appearance in two influential tarot decks designed by members of the Order. The Rider Waite Smith deck and, of course, the Toth deck. Is it Toth or is it Thoth? I think it's Toth. Hold on, I can actually find out right now. Toth, 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 Toth. Um, uh, tout. <laughs> Does it say tout. Turns out I don't know how to read pronunciation guides. I'm just gonna keep calling him Toth because it's uh, it works for me. And if I'm wrong and it's driving you nuts, I apologize. Um, in addition, occultist Israel Regadi involved himself in two separate recreations of the original Golden Dawn deck. The Golden Dawn Tarot of 1978 with art by Robert Wang and the new Golden Dawn Ritual Tarot by Sheik and Sandra Cicero, <laughs> released after Regardi's death in 1991. But that really jumped from like 1880 to 1991. The central document containing the Golden Dawn's tarot interpretations, Book T, was first published openly, if not under that title, by, and here's a big name in the occult, Alistair Crowley in his occult periodical The Equinox in 1912. The volume was later republished ind independently in 1967. That's the name. I knew you'd all know. Everyone knows good old Crowley. Uh, they have this big chart here that associates uh, each card to its Hebrew letter and its element or uh, sign. 
that they all gave them here and I'm not gonna go over them all because that's just a bunch of in one ear out the other here but that just has a couple examples here uh, they have the high priestess it uh, uh, matches to the Hebrew letter Gimel and the moon or justice uh, Oh, I'm going to find one that can pronounce uh, death, for instance, instead. Uh, goes to the Hebrew letter Nun and the Scorpio sign. So that's basically it. It's like, hey, if you draw the, draw the magician, that can also mean Mercury. It can also mean Bet. Whatever. Um, and they go a little bit more further into uh, Aleister Crowley's involvement here. The Rider Waite Smith deck released in 1909 was the first complete card of antique tarot deck other than those derived from a, from Atele's Egyptian tarot. That's a bit of a jump too because that was that was a couple hundred years prior. Oswald Wirth's 1889 deck had only depicted the major arcana. Okay, there you go. The deck designed by Arthur Edward Waite was executed by Pamela Coleman Smith, a fellow Golden Dawn member, and was the first tarot deck to feature complete scenes for each of the 36 suit cards between 2 and 10 since the Sola Busca Tarot of the 15th century. With designs very probably based in part on a number of photographs of them held by the British Museum. Neat. The deck followed the Golden Dawn in its choice of suit names and in swapping the order of the Trumps and Justice and Strength, but essentially preserved the traditional designations of the court cards. The court, uh, the deck was followed by the release of the Key to the Tarot, also by Waite, in 1910. The Toth deck, first released as part of Aleister Crowley's The Book of Toth in 1944, represent a somewhat different evolution of the original Golden Dawn designs. The deck executed by Lady Frida Harris as a series of paintings between 1938 and 1942 owes much to Crowley's development of Thelema in the years following the dissolution of the Hermetic Order. While the deck follows the Golden Dawn teachings with respect to the zodiacal associations of the major arcana and the associations of the minor arcana with the various astrological decans, it also does a bunch of other things, and quite frankly, it's getting a little bit, uh, it's getting a little bit wordy. Uh, hold on, I'm just gonna... Give this a quick... Ah, here we go, here we go. Criticisms. This is where we get a little bit of, uh... What's the word I'm looking for? A little bit of discord here. Skeptic James Ramdy once said, For use as a divinatory device, the tarot deck is dealt out in various patterns and interpreted by a gifted reader. The fact that the deck is not dealt out into the same pattern 15 minutes later is rationalized by the occultists by claiming that in the short span of time, a person's fortune can change too. That would seem to call for rather frequent readings if the system is to be of any use whatsoever. You know? You may have a point. Tarot historian Mike... Tarot historian Michael Dumain similarly critiqued occultic uses throughout his various works, remarking that the history of the esoteric use of tarot cards is an oscillation between the two poles of vulgar fortune telling and high magic. Though the fence between them may have collapsed in places, the story cannot be understood if we fail to discern the difference between the regions it demarcates. As a historian, Dumay held particular disdain for what he called the most successful propaganda campaign ever launched, noting that an entire false history and false interpretation of the tarot pack was concocted by the occultists, and it is all but universally believed. <laughs> Readings are entity agnostic. Technically, in all probability, any tarot card spread is meant for its audience at the time of reception. This is contrary to the belief that certain persons, i.e. astrological signs, are given specialized readings. For instance, a reader on YouTube may post a spread for Capricorn, January 20XX. However, anybody watching that video should be able to deduce something from those energies. Yeah, you know, that's the thing with pre-recorded uh, tarot readings. You can't trust them. Some religious groups discourage divination, including tarot card readings. Leviticus 19.26 and Deuteronomy 18.9-12 have been cited as proof texts on this subject by Christian writers. Other groups may be accepting of at least some forms of tarot reading. So hold on, let's, let's uh, pull up those verses here real quick. Let's see what this proof is. Leviticus 19.26.
let's see uh, we're gonna go for the um, King James because uh, it's not the most accurate version but it is the most fancy sounding version you shall not eat anything with the blood nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying okay that seems fairly fairly out right there uh, and then, okay what's the next one here Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 18 9 Okay, okay, here we go. When thou art come into the Lord, no, when you art come, when you art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or one who conjures spells, or him, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all though, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now, I have always said, if we're going to get into a more theological debate about it all, uh, regardless of what you believe in theologically here, um... I've always taken a little bit of issue with modern Christianity basing their rule sets and whatnot on like super Old Testament texts because most of that, especially like Levitican code, that was like, hey, here's some rules for all you Jewish people to follow. And most of it was like common sense stuff uh, like Leviticus in references like, you know, don't get tattoos. Oh, why? Why would that be? Why would that be the case? Uh, because if you do it incorrectly, you can get ink poisoning and die. And back then they probably didn't do it properly very well at all. Or don't eat unclean meat. Why? Because you'll probably get sick. OK, that's why people nowadays eat pork all the time, because we can eat it cleanly and we can eat it properly and it's not going to give you issues here. Uh, so I think citing Old Testament text from this is a l always a little bit of a uh, cop-out if you're talking about a theological reason to uh, defy something here. Now, if there were a New Testament one and, the, and a Christian said, hey, I don't want to do it because it says right here in you know, Matthew 3.16, and Jesus said, don't read tarot cards, I'd be like, okay, fair. You know what? That's all right. If that's what you believe go ahead but uh there's there's too much th stuff especially in leviticus where it's like hey uh you can beat your wife but only if uh, the stick you use isn't bigger than your thumb it's like uh i don't know it seems not um it seems pretty much not relevant to the modern world at all so yeah um if a Christian group wants to cite those two verses as a reason to not get their fortune told, I would probably tell them that's a that's a crock. That's a load of big barbecue beef tips, which are delicious, admittedly, here. What about the Major Arcana? We got anything to talk about with the Major Arcana? We know that they are the trump cards of a tarot pack. Obviously, uh, here's, here's here's just the rundown here. Here's the list of it here. You got the fool, you got the magician, the high priestess, the empress, the emperor, the hierophant, the lovers, the chariot, justice, the hermit, wheel of fortune, strength, the hanged man, death, temperance, the devil, the tower, the star, the moon, the sun, judgment, and finally the world. Anybody who plays the Binding of Isaac has all of those memorized. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, and you know, the list just kind of goes on and on and on here. Like we've, we've got, uh, man, yeah, they, they have a Wikipedia page for every single card here. The Fool, for instance, we'll just, we'll just talk about him for a little bit here. The Fool is titled Lamat in the Tarot of... Marseille and Ilamato in most Italian language tarot decks. These archaic words mean the madman or the beggar and may be related to the word for checkmate in relation to the original use of tarot cards for gaming purposes. In the earliest tarot decks, the fool is usually depicted as a beggar or a vagabond. So see, <laughs> treating homeless people like garbage is clearly uh, not a recent trend. Uh, if, if you make a car called the fool and it's a homeless person, it's like, wow. What a jerk. 
In the Visconti Sforza tarot deck, the fool wears ragged clothes and stockings without shoes and carries a stick on his back. He has what appears to be feathers in his hair. His unruly beard and feathers may relate to the tradition of the woodwose or wild man. Another early Italian image that relates to the tradition is the first and lowest of the series and the so-called Tarocci of Mantegna. This series of prints containing images of social roles, allegorical figures, and classical deities begins with Misero, a depiction of a beggar leaning on a staff. A similar image contained in the German Hofamtespiel. There the fool is depicted as a barefoot man in robes, apparently with belts on his hood playing a bagpipe. <laughs> what do we draw for the fool? I don't know, play a guy who plays bagpipes. <laughs> No one's going to like him anyway. <laughs> I actually do enjoy bagpipes myself, but, uh, you know. Let's see here. I'm just trying to find anything interesting to read here. There's a bunch of stuff about, like, oh, as as low as Trump, as excuse, as high as Trump, all this. But I, I don't know enough about terror reading for it to make any sense here. In other media. <laughs> it had to happen. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders, uses tarot cards to name the character Stands. An ornery yet intelligent Boston Terrier named Iggy uses the stand named The Fool with the power to control sand. Yep. I've seen it. <laughs> of course I had to mention it. The Persona game franchise uses tarot cards to symbolize major characters in the games and to categorize personas. The protagonists of the third, fourth, and fifth game are loosely represented by the Fool, with Persona 3 and 4 also using the Fool to represent their group as a whole, and Persona 5 using it to represent the character Igor. That I didn't know. I have Persona 4, I just haven't, like, really dug deep into it yet. How about the Magician? What do you got here? Uh, let's see. The magician is a practitioner is a practitioner of stage magic. At least in the French iconography. <laughs> uh, let's see, see, see. Yeah. He's the second lowest in the series, outranking only the beggar. Man, the dude who can literally cast spells is only above the literal homeless guy. That's uh. So, royal shame there. Visually, the 18th century woodcuts reflect earlier iconic representations and can be compared to the free artistic renditions in the 15th century hand-painted taros made for the Visconti and Sforza families. In the painted cards attributed to uh, Bonifacio Bembo, the magician appears to be playing with cups and balls. Even back then, even back then, the dude who was trying to learn magic did that, did that goofy, oh, hey, found a ball behind your ear trick. It's fantastic. Uh, unlike The Fool, The Magician does not have a in popular culture section, so uh, clearly The Fool outranks him somewhere. Let's see, we have the High Priestess, who is of course uh, depicted as a, a lady. You know, in all of these pictures, the High Priestess is wearing all of her clothes. In the game Taboo, The Sixth Sense, the Priestess was just boobs out not caring it's like what's with that man y'all just decided that uh she did not deserve robes her uh she did, she also doesn't have an icon an iconography section like the past two cards clearly people couldn't agree how to uh <laughs> lay these articles out the empress is uh of course also shown to be a uh feminine character on the card but of course a little more grandeur to it the picture that i'm looking at right now has her leaning back on a uh kind of a lounge looking chair with her staff next to her head and yes she's looking very very proper full of pomp and all of that here the emperor very similarly, you know, sitting upon his throne, he's got a staff in his right hand here, gazing at you with a judging look on his face. Now, the Hierophant, what exactly does this even mean? In many modern packs, the Hierophant is represented with his right hand raised in blessing or benediction, with two fingers pointing skyward and two pointing down, thus forming a bridge between heaven and earth, reminiscent of that formed by the body of the hanged man. The Hierophant is thus a true pontiff in that he is the builder of the bridge between deity and humanity. In his left hand, he held a triple cross. 
which is you know it's it's across and you got one two three yeah i'm sure you can envision it the hierophant is typically male even in decks that take a feminist view of the tarot such as the mother piece tarot the hierophant was also known as the teacher of wisdom okay so he's he's kind of like a bishop or something like that what is this mother piece tarot card inspired by the goddess movement and second wave feminism <laughs> okay <laughs> it has never been it has never been out of print and in 2017 was given a new life in the uh christian dior fashion collection <laughs> of course classic uh next we have the lovers uh depicted by what one might call kind of an adam and eve-esque visualization here they're in kind of a lovely looking garden uh they're naked adam's hanging dong eve's in her birthday suit here uh this article once again does reference jojo's bizarre adventure again of course yep one of the steely dan's stand was of course named after the lovers i don't remember every single stand from jojo though so you know that's a it's a little reminder to me the chariot you're never going to guess what the chariot is represented by it's a chariot uh a figure sits in a chariot although he holds no rope he is pulled by two sphinxes or horses i like the sphinxes more you know if you're gonna go with tarot you gotta go all the way you need to be as gaudy as possible you can't just be like yeah and here's a regular chariot got horses they're just regular brown horses no 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 the sphinxes the one in the wikipedia article right here he's got one black sphinx and one white sphinx and they're just they're about to tear into you here there's often a black and white motif for example one of the steeds may be black and the other white the figure may be crowned or helmeted and is winged in some representations not in this one that i'm looking at here the figure may hold a sword or wand Oh, fancy. He is indeed holding a wand. Let's see. The Toth tarot deck has the figure controlling four animals. Gee, Chariot, how come your mom lets you have four sphinxes? Some people get all the luck. Justice. It's the dude holding a sword, really. He's sitting on his, uh... Oh, no, no, I see, I see. He's sitting on his throne. He's got a sword sticking upright in his right hand. He's holding the scales in the other hand. All right, that's that's where justice comes from, I suppose, there. Uh, I was, I was going to say, what does this have to do with justice? He's just holding his sword up in the air, holding it very awkwardly. But no, no, he's got the scales of justice, so that makes sense. The hermit. It's just an old man holding his staff holding a lantern i could go on and read all of this stuff but no 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 reason no reason we're just chilling now a version of waits the hermit designed by barrington colby is depicted on the inner jacket sleeve of led zeppelin 4 huh i'll have to check that out i have it on vinyl upstairs <laughs> wheel of fortune now this this is kind of a anachronism here because the wheel of fortune tarot card is represented by an extremely colorful wheel with pat sajak to the right and vanna white to the left they have a big board with letters on it and it just says wheel of fortune on it i'm not sure actually it makes sense uh it looks like tarot can in fact predict the future and they properly predicted it with the wheel of fortune that's neat the strength card is just a dude fighting a lion <laughs> i mean if if you're gonna depict strength it may as well be a man fighting a lion some people may argue that they prefer bear fights but uh, i cannot deny the intensity of this man with his uh, hands wrapped around this lion's skull that's that's pretty good uh the hanged man yes so as was mentioned previously, uh, the hanged man does occasionally do the same whole, ooh, got my fingers up and down kind of thing, heaven and earth, all that. Uh, but typically, yeah, it's just a dude hanging upside down on a tree. He's got a rope around his foot and he's got his leg crossed behind the other one, his arms behind his back like this. And honestly, he looks like he's fine with it. 
Despite hanging, likely due to stealing a single tomato from the wrong person, uh, yeah, life could be worse. <laughs> he's, he's looking fairly fine with the situation that he has found himself in, and he's, uh, you know, he's seen... He seemed to be taking the best of it. Death is the best card because it is typically portrayed by a skeleton. <laughs> I got one skeleton here holding a scythe. Uh, actually, a lot of them are holding scythes. That's, 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 that's kind of the death thing. It makes sense, you know, the whole Grim Reaper motif. Hats off to you, death card. You are one of the best. Temperance. What? is temperance. All right, it is one of the cardinal virtues. Of course, that's when you don't drink, right? Defined as moderation or self-restraint, it is represented with the dilution of wine with water. Oh, that's what that is. Okay, yeah, so it's showing an angel. He's got two goblets. He's pouring water into the other goblet, so he's basically saying, this wine is too strong. Give me weaker wine. I, uh, I wanted Francia, but I accidentally bought the most expensive bottle of red. I don't know my wine brands enough to uh, give you a proper joke there. I don't know, I'm, I'm sorry. Now the devil, this one you see everywhere here. This was parodied on uh, Tenacious D's very first album. It's It's got the devil. He's standing on some block thing. He's got his hand up in the air. He's scowling at you he's got a naked man and woman in front of him they've got shackles on them he's like i am the devil and you are not and i am evil past that point we have the tower which is depicted by a tower oh god this <laughs> this tower appears to be on fire and there are people falling out of it something went horribly horribly wrong with the tower suffice to say we have the star, which is uh, just a very naked lady gathering some water from the pond. From the pond, or actually, it, it looks like she's adding water to the pond. She's just kind of pouring water out. You know, back then, purified water was not so easy to come across. You don't just want to waste it willy nilly like that. Uh, to the card's credit, though, there is a massive star above her, and I assume that that's the focal point. They just kind of detract your attention from it by the fact that there is this incredibly naked woman pouring water into a pond. So you'd be forgiven to misinterpret that card. We have the moon, which according to the Rider Waite tarot deck here, which is what most of these examples have been pulled from, uh, shows two dogs howling at the moon with a lobster. <laughs> there is a large lobster in the pond in front of the dogs just kind of reaching up at the moon as well so whatever oh sorry it's a crayfish yeah it's straight up full description the card depicts a night scene where two large pillars are shown a wolf and a domesticated dog held the moon while crayfish emerges from the water I guess, yeah, so that's a regular part of it. The crayfish is a vital part of the whole picture. We have the sun, which shows uh, what looks to be a uh, nude child riding a horse with a very large sun above it and a bunch of sunflowers in the background. You know what? The most wholesome of all the cards I've seen right now. The judgment looks a little more doomed, though. We have a bunch of naked people. Nudity is a pretty big concept with tarot cards, I'm finding out right here. Uh, more often than not, people aren't wearing any clothes at all. Uh, but we've got a bunch of people standing in what look like coffins in the middle of the ocean, raising their arms up while an angel blurts, probably careless whisper down at them from a trumpet. <laughs> they had a wild imagination back when they invented the tarot, you know? And then finally, we have the world, which you're never going to guess involves a naked lady. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to describe this to you. Just close your eyes and take this in. We have a naked woman. She's holding what looks like a baton in each hand. There is a large purple sash kind of wrapped around her body with a huge oval-shaped wreath kind of bordering her body. Uh, in the four corners, we have the side profile of an individual with long blonde hair. We have an eagle, a lion, and what appears to be uh, either an ox or a goat. 
but I'm not certain <laughs> which, because it's kind of just a, uh, um, a nondescript looking animal. But then again, in this other one here, it looks more like a bear or a capybara. So the bottom left hand corner animal up for interpretation. I know you can't see any of the stuff that I'm looking at and I know that this has been an incredibly bizarre episode and I know that you saw a whole six or seven minutes of gameplay uh, but that's time and if you spent the entire time here with me you know what that's very kind of you. <laughs> I did my best to try to do something to make this interesting and honestly just doing readings over and over and over that don't make sense in the game would have made for probably a worse episode than me literally just we literally just reading you Wikipedia articles about the tarot. I learned a few things, you know, I had no idea that its original intention was to just literally be a game. So that's new to me. Uh, so yeah, nice little history lesson here. Uh, you can learn a lot of things just from trekking around on Wikipedia here. I, uh, hmm. I hope you enjoyed it, despite the bizarre nature of the episode. Now, normally that would be the end of April 1989. However, I'm going to append one game onto the end of it, because in 1989, a single lone game came out in May, May of 1989. So I'm going to append that to April so it's not so lonely, and that means our final game of this release cycle will be Operation Wolf. So join me next time for an actual video game where we actually get some gameplay. It's a light gun game, but you can use the controller. It's not going to be as fun that way, but at least I can try it out and kind of see what's going on. So anyway, thank you for bearing with me on this one. I hope you found it in some ways invigorating. If not, oh well, there's always next episode. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.